Grace to you and peace from God our Father and our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. We've got a, some, a series of slides here at the beginning of the message. Uh, Spencer, can you show us the next slide? There we go. You've probably seen this before. Uh, it's one of those, what do you see? Do you see the negative space, the black, the white space, or do you see the, the black space? Do you see the faces, or do you see the chalice? These are kind of fun. There's a whole bunch of them. It's not the only way that you, you sort of have help, used to help people think about their perspective and how they see things. Here's another one. How many legs does that elephant have? That's, that looks uncomfortable. Uh, it's, uh, that's just odd. How about the next one? This, one, this is fun. These are, there's a whole bunch of these on, you can find on the internet. It's called forced perspective. Uh, you make somebody in the back, put somebody in the background, and, and have somebody in the foreground doing something strange. So it looks like this guy's holding up this tiny little woman there. So the forced perspective, you probably do that. Uh, so, so here's another one. Imagine turning the corner to your house, and that's what you saw as your streets. Like, whoa! Where, how far down does that go? And what's the next one, Spence? Yeah, I found that one. <laughs> that's, that's just weird. How do you see things? How do you see the world? How do you see, especially, how do you see the people around you in the world? That's one of the things that the girl of Good Samaritan is about. So this guy comes to Jesus and he says, Good teacher, what do I have to do to gain eternal life? And Jesus throws it back on him and says, Well, you know the scriptures. How do you, how do you read it? Uh, love the Lord your God, all your heart, all your soul, all your strength, love your neighbor as yourself. There it is, says Jesus. Go do that. He says, So who's my neighbor? Help me see who my neighbor is. Because I don't see a lot of them, apparently. Help me see who my neighbor is. So then Jesus tells the parable. There's a man, he was on the road from Jericho to Jerusalem, and he falls among some thieves. There are some thieves who are lying in wait, and they see a mark, and they attack. That's the first way that people in the world see others. They see him as a mark, or they don't see him as, at all. The thieves were lying in wait for someone that they could take advantage of. Interesting the way that they, they were thinking about people. Not just, not just that, but if you weren't a mark, then you weren't worthy of their attention. They're only looking for what they can get from somebody else. They don't have any used car salesmen, they don't do This is a common way that people think about other people as a mark, as somebody that they can, they can use or not use, and they're only important on the basis of what that person can do for me or I can get from that person. That's how the thieves looked at the world. Then there are two others in the story. Two came one after the other. A priest sees this man beaten and bloody and lying on the side of the road. He walks by. A Levite comes down, uh, sees this man beaten and bloody, and he, sees, he, he walks by. And it doesn't exactly say why, but you get the impression that they're afraid. They saw that person as a threat. As a threat. Paid attention to the news lately? The way the world, our country right now, is, is on the verge of seeing other people as, are you a threat or not? Based on your politics, are you a threat? Based on your skin color, are you a threat? No matter what that is. Everybody's a threat. You've got to take care of yourself. You have to protect yourself. You have to stay safe. You have to skirt those around you. Just ignore the problems around you. And stay safe. Stay out of all that problem and all that mess. Because the world's a threatening place and people are a threat. For the priest and the Levite, even if that man wasn't a threat, there may be the, the, the thieves, the bandits still in the area. The threat was still there. And they were afraid. And they walked on by. Some people see other, others as a mark, something to be used for their benefit or ignored. Other people see just something to be afraid of, except for their own little band of friends, just somebody to be afraid of. And then Jesus tells a third person, the Samaritan, there's a whole lot of this, this parable has to go, it goes into what it means to be a Samaritan. Essentially, a Samaritan was a 
a sort of a half-Jewish person who, whom the full-blooded Jewish people really didn't respect very much. But the Samaritan sees this man on the side of the road, beaten and bloody, and he takes care of him. Not only does he sort of attend to him at the scene, but he puts him on his donkey, he takes him to an inn, he provides for his care and for his continuing care. He sees him as a neighbor. He sees him as a human being. When Jesus tells this parable, it's more than just a story that's told to help this guy understand he's supposed to care for other people around him much better. Jesus tells this story to talk about the way that everybody looks at the world and the problems that we have in our false perception. By human nature, we want to see people either as a mark, as somebody that I can use for my benefit, or somebody who's not important to me at all, as sort of a thing, if you will, that provides for me. Or we're afraid of what they might do. We're afraid of people. We see them as a threat. The world, since almost, what, 30 days after it began turning, it seems, has been in this little drama, where threat after threat after threat leads to violence and war and violence and war because we see other people as either threats or we see them as marks. The thing that's very hard to do is to do what the Samaritan did, to do what Jesus did. To see people as a neighbor so that you can love your neighbor as yourself. This series is about speaking the gospel to other people. And it seems to me that there's a lot, of a, a lot of parallels, if you will, between this story and the problems that we have when we think about telling somebody else about Jesus, or about our faith, or offering to pray for someone. It seems that the parallels those are pretty close. I have a concern about the way we teach people about what evangelism is. It's a big, scary thing. It's a long word. It's not a word you use normally in life. <clears throat> but I remember when I was in college, they, had, they made all of us, because I was going to Christian college, they made all of us go through an evangelism program. And here's what they would do. They would say to you, you have, you have to do chit-chat first. You, know, you have to loosen the person up. And then there are two questions for you to ask. First question is this. If you were to die tonight, do you believe that you would go to heaven? And then there was like a flow chart with the answers. And then the second question that followed on that first was, if you were to stand before God and he were to ask you, why should I let you into my heaven, what would you say? I always had a problem with that approach to talking about Jesus. I don't think I would have said this at the time, but it seems to me that it treats other people like a mark, like the thieves. It treats them like like they've got something that I'm going to get if I do it right. I'm going to get good feelings. I'm going to get tally mark on the wall, whatever. I'm going to get something out of this good. And if they don't answer the questions right, well then we'll just ignore them. Why? I mean, why, even, why would that creep into Christians' ideas about evangelism? Because we're human. And because that's one of the ways we are tempted to see people. It's not like you only see people as a marker, you only see people as a threat. That's how we see people. As a marker is a threat. And it can, can seep into our ideas about how we would go about telling somebody else about our faith as well. You can view them as a mark, which is tragic, trouble. On the other hand, one of the things that we, especially these days maybe, have a, a bit of a problem with is we as Christians, as far as our Christianity goes, are kind of afraid of sharing that with others. Because we live in a culture right now where the elites of the culture don't want anything to do with Christianity. They consider it sort of passe. That was for previous eras and previous times. But we've sort of grown beyond that. And any thinking person knows that Christianity to us doesn't, doesn't measure up anymore. Any thinking person knows this. And then it gets worse than that. You, there are some of the sort of professional atheists or amateur atheists, um, they can say some very harsh things about you and your faith and the, the lack of intellect that you display about your faith and all those things. 
and, and it feels very much like a threat. And so we don't say anything. And we don't see any opportunities to say anything because we're afraid. We're afraid that we're going to be embarrassed. We're afraid that people are going to think less of us. We're afraid that people are going to think that we're just not that smart. And honestly, in this area, what could be worse if <laughs> you thought not that smart? It's fear. And there's a threat. Do you see a mark? Do you see a threat? Or do you see a neighbor? A neighbor. I looked up neighbor. A neighbor, this, this is a, the three definitions for neighbor. One, one who lives near or next to another. Okay, that's uh, interesting. Uh, I thought the second one was interesting. A, a person, place, or thing adjacent to or late located near another. I'm not sure how that's a help. But the third definition, and I thought, I thought it was fascinating, this is the third definition. The third definition of a neighbor is a fellow human. Who's my neighbor? Who's my neighbor? The man asked Jesus. So Jesus tells this parable. He tells a parable about a man in a situation that's frightening, who is taken as a mark by some thieves, and he's left beaten and bloody on the road. And others would pass him by, but someone saw him as a fellow human being. The Samaritan was able to see that man beaten and bloody and see himself there. See that as someone also who has flesh and bone, who needs blood to, to course through his veins in order for him to live, who needs oxygen to breathe, who probably has a family, who feels pain, both physical pain and emotional pain, all the things that we feel as human beings, this one too. This is one of those. This is a human being. And this is a human being. And it's that understanding of Jesus, or of other people, that understanding of other people, which was Jesus' understanding. It's that understanding of other people that helps us to live real life and helps us to not be afraid and be more open as we share our faith with other people who are beaten and bloody, beaten up and bloody by this world fellow human being who, who could have the same joy, the same freedom, the same relief from pain, the same hope that we do if they heard about Jesus. It takes something different to be able to see people in this way. It takes the cross. It takes the cross to help you to be able to see that other person as a human being and not a mark and not a threat. You've probably heard the line frequently, the, the, the ground at the foot of the cross is level. And it is. But you could say, the cross makes the ground level. Because the cross means it doesn't matter whether you're beaten and bloody, it doesn't matter whether you're intelligent, it doesn't matter whether you're sometimes tempted to see people as a mark, it doesn't matter whether you are afraid of people, this God came here for you and for every other human being. For every other human being. The cross isn't a message that if you're smart enough to believe in Jesus, you get good things from God. The cross isn't the message that God is, is somehow looks at you who believe and says, you're more special than everybody else. The cross instead is that, that message from God that we are, all of us, broken human beings for whom Jesus came. And when I can see my friend, my co-worker, my person who lives next to me as a neighbor, as a human being, then I'm less inclined to see them as a mark for my evangelism or a mark for anything else. And then I'm less inclined to be afraid of what they might say when I need to tell them about a hope that I have or offer to pray for a concern that they have. Because Jesus came for me and made me his neighbor. He moved into our neighborhood and took on flesh and blood to live here with human beings who struggle and suffer, who live and die who have pains and joys, who are human beings. God 
the eternal God took on flesh and became my neighbor. And the message of his cross changed, changes everything about the way I see not, even, not just the world and not just the, the, my God and not just you, my fellow believers, but everyone else. Whether I like them or not, whether I perceive them as a threat or, or not, whether I'm tempted to see them as a mark or not, they are my neighbor. They're a human being because of the cross and the vision that that gives us. In the name of Jesus, amen. We stand and confess our faith in the words of the people.